and welcome to the NRMN Health Research Talk. I'm Ann Smith. Today we'll be talking with Dr. Gareth Dutton. Dr. Dutton is Associate Professor of Medicine with UAB Preventive Medicine. He'll be talking with us about how can we reduce obesity through behavioral interventions. Dr. Dutton, welcome. Thank you, it's very good to be here. What will we be discussing about obesity today? Well, we're gonna go through a few different things. Uh, I wanna begin by talking about the, some definitions. So medically, what do we mean? How do we define obesity? Um, and then also talk about the consequences, the, the health consequences and other potential negative effects of excess body weight. Um, and then really I wanted to spend most of our time today talking about treatment options and um, both the theoretical rationale for those options. Um, I wanna talk about sort of unpackage what treatment looks like for most participants in an evidence-based program. Um, we'll talk about the research to support the outcomes from these um, programs, so how effective are the weight loss programs that we have available. And then we'll also talk about some of the challenges to implementation of these, particularly in real world settings. And then I'll finish uh, by talking about some future research directions in which we want to go. So I guess to begin, it's important to really understand what we're talking about when we, when we use the word obesity. And there are some clinical definitions that are used to define these terms. And so what you see here is a table of different categories of, of weight status. And the way we typically define weight is based on body mass index or BMI. So that's the ratio of someone's weight to their height. And so what you see here is beginning with normal weight, that's a BMI between 18.5 and 24.9, that is considered a normal or, or healthy body weight. But even there, the recommendations, the current clinical recommendations are not that these people need to lose weight, but if you're in the normal weight range, it's important to be mindful of your weight and to try to avoid weight gain. Because we know that across the life course, people tend to gain weight over time. So it's important, even if you're in the normal weight range, to be aware of that so that you don't, as you age and, and transition through the lifespan, that you don't gain excess weight. That makes good sense. Yeah, so then that's the recommendation for normal weight. When you move down the continuum into the overweight range, that's a BMI between 25 and 29.9. 29 um, again, there the main goal is to avoid additional weight gain if there's no other comorbidities present. But the current recommendations are that if someone is overweight and they have one or more additional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So these are things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, a, a larger than um, recommended waist circumference. Um, if any of one of those things are present along with the excess body weight, then that's when weight loss would be recommended. And the current guidelines are a weight loss between five and 10% of body weight. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the last three categories there are all in uh, the obesity range. And there's three categories of obesity, class one, class two, and class three that are just levels of severity. So anything with a BMI, anyone with a BMI greater than 30 would be considered in one of these three ranges. Um, with a BMI over 40 being the most severe level of obesity, a class three obesity. And for all of those, any BMI is greater than 30. That's again where weight loss of five to 10% is recommended. And I think this is a really important point for people because, I mean, take for example, someone that may weigh 200 pounds. Okay. Five to 10% of weight loss is 10 to 20 pounds. So you're talking about going from a weight of 200 pounds to a weight of 190 pounds, which doesn't seem like that much. And the reality is for a lot of participants or patients or other individuals that want to lose weight, that may not be anywhere close to where they want to be. They may want to lose much more and that's fine. But from a clinical perspective and from a health perspective, we know that five to 10% of weight loss is very meaningful for people in terms of reducing their risk for health complications and other consequences of excess body weight. So right. um, I think that's important to recognize that if people wanna lose more, they certainly can, but the current recommendations are five to 10%. Yes, and based on some of the evidence-based uh, research to find that out. That's exactly right. So also worth mentioning the prevalence of obesity. So the, the slide that you see here looks at US adults. These are the most recent numbers from the Centers for Disease Control. Mm -hmm. And what you see here are the prevalence rates for obesity in the US. And across all groups, the current um, prevalence of obesity is about 38% of US adults. So 
a relatively high number, but you also see that there's some variability across different subgroups of the population. So the solid colors are men. So this is broken out by white men, black men, and Hispanic men. And then the striped bars are women. So again, the red stripes are white women, the blue stripes are black women, and the green stripes are Hispanic women. Mm -hmm. So what you see is that for the first four categories, for the men and the white women, they're around that national average of about 38%. But when you look at minority women, and really African American women in particular, the prevalence rates of obesity are much higher. So these are certainly groups that are um, at greater risk of, of obesity based on current trends. And then when you, that's BMI of all categories, all okay. BMI greater than 30. When you look at the more extreme levels of obesity, the more severe levels of obesity, which is a BMI of 40 or greater, Again, you see some disparities. So here you see some gender differences. So men have a little bit of a lower rate of obesity, the more class three level obesity compared to women. And again, you see those racial differences with African American women in particular seeming to be at greater risk for the, the more severe levels of obesity. Mm -hmm. And then it's also important to think about, well, what are the, why do we recommend weight loss? So what are the health consequences of, of obesity? And there's certainly lots of medical reasons to try to lose weight. Um, people are very familiar with those. But in addition to health consequences of obesity, there's also um, psychological consequences, social consequences. And so here you see listed some of the more common consequences of excess body weight. So certainly we know from lots and lots of research that excess body weight is associated with greater risk for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, stroke, osteoarthritis. There are certainly certain types of cancer. Some of the more common types of cancer are associated with, with obesity, sleep apnea. And then in the mental health domain, we know from lots of research that folks with obesity also have higher levels of depressive symptoms. So there's some mental health consequences and relationships there. And then also in terms of physical functioning and quality of life. So people being able to get around and do everyday tasks, we know that those, there's some impairments there when there's excess body weight involved. And then also more in the social and, 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 and sort of environmental domain, we know that those who are obese um, are also the subject of discrimination in, in lots of venues. So mm -hmm. discrimination happens at home and in the workplace and the school setting, um, really across the life course from young kids up to older adults that experience discrimination related to their body weight. Um, and then we certainly know that there's health care costs there. So given all the health consequences of obesity, the, the, the health care costs are, are much higher for those individuals. Mm -hmm. So and in addition to all of the health consequences and other consequences listed here, there's also excess mortality or premature death associated with obesity. So here on the right side of the screen, what you see is that for those with a BMI greater than 30, so again, those are people in the obese range, the risk of premature death is significantly higher for those people compared to those of lower weight status for specific health conditions like coronary heart disease, other types of cardiovascular disease, and certain types of cancer. So that goes back to the idea that this is certainly um, a condition that needs treatment mm -hmm. for most people. Yes, well, what are the treatment options for obesity? Yeah, that's a good question. So when you think about treatment options for obesity, I think about them sort of falling into three categories. So you have what I'll call behavioral or lifestyle interventions for obesity. You also have pharmacotherapy options, and then for some participants or for some patients, for some individuals, uh, there's bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. So if you think about each three of those, there's a few things I think that are worth pointing out. For lifestyle or behavioral interventions, that's really recommended across the continuum of weight status, from overweight to all categories of obesity. For pharmacotherapy, those are recommended for, for many individuals, but there's more restrictions on the lower end of the weight status in the overweight category for who would qualify or for who would be indicated to receive pharmacotherapy. That would be medications. Exactly, medications for weight loss. And, and in that domain, for a long time, there weren't a lot of treatment options available, um, mm -hmm. and some were pulled off the market for adverse events and that sort of thing. There are, in the, in the past few years, there's been a growing number of medications that are available for the treatment of obesity. Um, but the other thing that I think is worth pointing out for medications is that a lot of these are not covered by insurance yet. 
So these are also very costly for individuals that want to, want to use that option. And then the third option, bariatric surgery, is really reserved for those more in the class three obesity, that's the BMI greater than 40. Mm -hmm. And in some cases with a less severe level of obesity like category two with a comorbidity present. So that's really reserved for a certain group. Um, and the other thing I think that's worth pointing out about these treatment options is all three are recommended but the first line of defense, really, the first line of treatment is the behavioral intervention. So that's, you, the, rec the current clinical guidelines are written such that you wouldn't include medication or surgery unless someone has already tried a behavioral or lifestyle intervention. So it's really the first line of treatment. And then the other thing I think it's important to keep in mind when you think about these three options is, it's not recommended that you would do medication or surgery in the absence of some sort of behavioral or lifestyle counseling. So it's really the behavioral lifestyle counseling that is the foundation for most participants and that most individuals. That makes sense. So when you think about the behavioral lifestyle intervention, which is the purpose of this talk and where we're really going to focus, I, I think it's important to think about the theoretical underpinning of, of that approach and understanding, well, why would that work and how do we target treatment uh, given that? So I think, first of all, when you think about understanding how obesity develops, it's important to think about how how people learn. And so the reality is food and eating is pervasive. It's a part of everything we do and, and it's everywhere you turn practically. So the idea with behavioral theory as it relates to treatment is that we learn our eating patterns and our activity patterns often very early in life, um, often through associations with other things. So food is paired with lots of other situations and circumstances, people perhaps, um, other routines, so we learn those patterns very early. So a classic example would be the movie theater. So when you go to the movie theater, what do you think of eating? People buy popcorn. They buy popcorn because it's an learned association. Mm -hmm. When you go to a Mexican restaurant, what do they bring to the table when you first sit down? Chips and salsa. Not or popcorn. Queso. Yeah. Right, chips and salsa. <laughs> so so that's, those are silly examples, but they're very real examples of how we learn very early on to pair food with certain things and so it's lots of activities when people a lot of people sit down to watch tv they think about a snack and then even if they're not eating a snack they see a commercial on tv for food so the associations are everywhere yes um, and we learn those patterns very early on so that's the first part of this this diagram is to show that there's lots of triggers and associations we've learned that cue us to eat or to be active or to be sedentary the other part of, of learning theory and behavioral theory that's important here is to understand that we're more or less likely to do things based on the consequences of those. So things that achieve, that achieve a positive consequence, are, we're more likely to do those again. And if there's a negative consequence for something, we're less likely to do those things. So here's where that gets really tricky with eating, because when you think about food, the positive consequences are are immediate, right? Mm -hmm. It feels good, it, it relieves hunger, uh, it may be enjoyable for people, it's a tasty you know, food. Um, those are all immediate benefits. And there are negative consequences, we talked about those previously in terms of the health consequences, but those are sort of off in the distance mm -hmm. and very long term. And, and it's human nature that we tend to sort of desire the immediate gratification. Yes. And we kind of discount those long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. And so a part of treatment as it relates to weight loss is really helping people reframe those so that they don't lose sight of those negative long-term consequences. And then it's also important to try to find other ways to reinforce the healthy behaviors, the healthier eating and the exercise that may not be inherently rewarding at first in the short term for people, but helping them find other ways to stay motivated and, and reinforce those positive changes they're trying to make. Yes. So that's sort of the underpinning of behavioral treatment. And so then with that in mind, the goal is to change those behaviors, those eating behaviors, those exercise behaviors. And so those are the two main targets. And so the ultimate goal is to decrease energy intake, so cut back on the food, food. Mm -hmm. and increase energy expenditure, so increase the physical activity and the exercise. Yes. And of course we all know that, right? Eat more, mm -hmm. eat less, and, and exercise more. 
The reality is that's not easy to do. Correct. So the other part of behavioral treatment is trying to change those behaviors in the context of what is a much more complicated situation. Mm -hmm. So it's recognizing that people are trying to modify their eating and their physical activity in the context of these environmental issues, these family issues. So they may be living with people who are to varying degrees supportive of these changes they're trying to make. They may be living in an environment where there's easy access to foods that are not conducive to helping them try to, to lead, lead a healthier lifestyle. They may be battling against cultural practices in terms of food preferences and what's an acceptable body size and, and that sort of thing. And, and there's lots of environmental barriers for some people, right? They may want to exercise more, but they have no safe neighborhood in which to do that. Yes. Or they want to eat more fruits and vegetables, but there's no easy access to those at their local supermarkets, or there may be no local supermarkets for some people. So it's really understanding um, how do people change these behaviors in the context of the world in which they live and change those behaviors despite the challenges that they, that they face. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I want to say about behavioral treatment is there's really got three primary underlying components and, and one is that it's process oriented. So the idea there is that it's not just learning things. It's not just an educational program. It really is an interactive learning new skills. It's not learning knowledge, it's learning skills. It's learning how to take new skills and apply it to your life. So it's very action oriented on the part of the individual. They're not just a passive recipient of information. Okay. The second thing is it's goal directed. So it's very much focused on what do you want to accomplish in terms of the behaviors you want to change and how are you going to get there. And then thirdly, as I alluded to, it's focused on behavior change. So there's lots of things about your weight that are out of your control, mm -hmm. but um, the behaviors are more under your control. Yes. And if you can modify the behaviors, then eventually the weight will, will follow suit. So the behavioral interventions are very much focused on changing the behaviors of individuals. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's worth mentioning is that all of this happens in this sort of feedback loop. So people set their goals and they try to reach those goals, but if for some reason they don't, then it's a process of working to figure out, well, why did that not work? What do I need to try to do differently? So there's a lot of problem solving involved to try to modify either the goals or modify the plan to get there. What do behavioral interventions include? Well, so they include a lot of different components. So one fundamental piece is certainly education. I said that education is not all, but certainly people need to know how to read a food label and how many calories should you be eating and what counts as physical activity and what's a healthy way to increase your exercise. Um, that's not sufficient, but it's important. And, and a lot of people come into weight loss programs having some knowledge about these things, but they often have a lot to learn too about their own behaviors and, and what they need to be doing. Uh, but that's one piece of it for sure. Uh, Self-monitoring is crucial. So one of the biggest parts, one of the foundational parts of a weight loss program is having people record everything that they're doing related to weight and exercise and eating. Mm -hmm. So we encourage people to self-monitor their body weight. So at least weekly, if not daily, they're weighing themselves or having someone weigh them and keeping a track, track of that over time. Um, they're monitoring their food intake and we'll talk more about that on the next slide. And also we like them to monitor their activity, whether it's walking or other exercises they're doing, keeping track of how much and how often they're doing that is an important part of treatment because it raises their awareness about what they're currently doing and what they want to be adding or taking away or doing differently. Mm -hmm. Goal setting, I mentioned this before, is a big part of treatment. And in some ways we give people specific recommendations, but really the ideal is to help them sort of tailor those goals they have for themselves. But in general, for most programs, if we want people to cut back on their energy intake, for most people that's going to be eating between 12 and 1800 calories per day. 
that can vary depending on the person and their individual goals and needs, but that's the general recommendation. On the exercise side of things, we usually recommend about 30 minutes of activity and potentially increasing from there. Mm -hmm. And then on the weight side, the goal is usually to lose about one to two pounds per week. So it's a gradual amount of weight loss. But again, we don't focus just on that because it's really the changes to the diet and the exercise that will get you those mm -hmm. weight loss goals. Um, in addition to that, there's problem solving. So it's really sort of figuring out what do you struggle with? What are the challenging situations you face when you go out to eat or you go to the movies or when you have a coworker bringing a cake in for, mm -hmm. for a snack? How are you gonna navigate those challenges and, and deal with that? So problem solving is very important. Stimulus control, that, that is um, basically a fancy way of saying sort of monitoring and, and changing your environment in some ways. So keeping your exercise shoes by the front door or, or in your car or um, keeping all of the high calorie foods in the back of the pantry or, or getting rid of those high calorie foods so they're not in the house to tempt you. Or for some people it's you know, maybe going a different way to work so they don't go by the fast food restaurant that calls their name you know, for breakfast. <laughs> yes. Something like that. So it's really sort of managing your environment to try to reduce the cues, those triggers that we talked about mm -hmm. that may lead to unhealthy behaviors. Um, social support is really important. So. There's lots of people in our lives that may be helpful or they may undermine our efforts that we're trying to make with weight loss. So helping people recognize what kind of support they need, whether it's emotional support, a you know, way to go, you're doing a great job, or it's more of a tangible, like I really need to ask someone to help me watch the kids so I can go exercise or help me prepare these healthier meals or you know have groceries in the house. So it's really helping people figure out what they need in terms mm -hmm. of help from other people and learning how to ask that in a way that they can get those needs met. Mm -hmm. Cognitive restructuring is another part. It's, it's what happens up here and a lot of times people are their own worst enemy in yeah. terms of what they say to themselves about their ability and their body weight and what they can do and when they hit bumps in the road in terms of weight loss, they, they can really beat themselves up about it. So here it's really teaching people to take a more objective, rational, less judgmental approach to how they're doing with things so that they don't sort of get into this spiral of feeling worse and worse about themselves. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, relapse prevention, this is the idea of for many people they may have a little slip, hit a bump in the road, and then they sort of throw in the towel or feel like all hope is lost. And so here it's really teaching people that you can have a slip and get back on track. And that's what we tell people all the time is, don't worry about the slip because that's gonna happen. Really what matters is how are you gonna respond to the slip after it's happened? Because mm -hmm. that's really where the battle is won or lost. Um, Stress management is another important part. I mean, changing your lifestyle to lose weight is hard and stressful in itself, and you're doing that in the context of work stress and family stress and other competing demands. So we do things like um, relaxation exercises, time management activities, to help people navigate those stressful situations because we know that if people are under a lot of stress, one of the first things to go are some of the healthier changes they're trying to make to their eating and exercise. Mm -hmm. And then body image is important because even with people that lose weight, sometimes they still have a very negative view of themselves and how they look and how they feel about their body. So here it's again related sort of to that cognitive restructuring to say, how can you be, sort of be less judgmental about your body regardless of your shape or size? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important part of treatment as well. And finally, one of the newer components of treatment um, that, that uh, to me makes a lot of sense is this mindful eating approach. And the idea here is that when you eat, really be aware and in the moment because so many times we eat sort of on the go and mindlessly and we're multitasking and people say, well, I ate, but I don't really remember eating. And you know, my perspective here is if you're, especially if you're cutting back on how much you can eat, you wanna enjoy it when you do eat mm -hmm. it, right? So here it's really about slowing down, doing nothing else but eating, and, 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 and being aware and in the moment in terms of all the senses, the smell, the taste, all of those things. Um, and I think what's beneficial here for people is when they slow down, they enjoy the food more, um, it also makes them more aware to sort of think, am I really still hungry? And they often slow down their eating, so sometimes they eat less because they've slowed down. So mm -hmm. they have more of a pause there and they'll stop eating sooner.
Yeah, it's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mentioned self-monitoring. I want to talk a little bit more about that um, because, as I said, it's really a key component of behavioral weight loss interventions. And, and, and what you see on the slide here is sort of the old-fashioned paper pencil record, an example of writing everything you eat down. This takes a lot of forms now. There's apps available. There's web-based self-monitoring. Um, but however you do it, we encourage people right from the get-go to write everything down. In fact, we think it's so important that this is the first thing we have people do before they even think about cutting back on calories or increasing their exercise. We say, we want you to spend a week doing nothing but writing everything down and tracking it. And, and we do that purposefully because, number one, I think it gives people some awareness about, you know, people will often say, gosh, I had no idea how many calories were in this food I eat all the time. Mm -hmm. or, I didn't realize how much late night snacking I did. Um, so I think it raises their awareness. And it's also really important to practice it without other changes because we think it's so important. We want people to get good at it because it'll help them succeed in the, in the long term. But the key with self-monitoring, and this is something we talk about with people, is the devil's in the details. So it's really s making sure that they capture everything because a lot of the foods we eat, the calories are kind of hidden. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of energy-dense foods that it doesn't take very much of to really push those calories way up. So when people complete these forms, we want them to really pay attention to the details. So if you had a sandwich, did it have cheese? Did it have mayonnaise on it? Um, if you had a salad, was there dressing on there or cheese or croutons? Because those things can add calories and it could be the difference between losing weight or staying the same or even gaining weight depending on how accurate you are in those totals. Yes. So that's a key component of treatment. So that's sort of the content. Let me talk a little bit about sort of the process of how treatment works. So treatment for weight loss can be delivered either in a group setting or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, both can be effective, although there is some research to suggest that group-based interventions may be more effective. And, and if you think about it, I think that makes sense because there's something about that camaraderie, that group support. There's other people sort of in the similar place as you. There's that healthy dose of competition and accountability to the group. So there is some indication that group-based interventions may produce better weight loss than one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, but, but both can work. Um, in terms of the modality, conventionally, traditionally, these have been delivered face-to-face, -face, either group or individual in-person contacts, but there's growing research to look at alternative ways of delivering these, um, such as phone-based interventions mm -hmm. or web-based interventions, even email and those sorts of things. And the general take-home there is that interventions that are delivered in person are certainly effective. Telephone-based interventions seem to be comparably effective. Web-based interventions are not there yet. Some are effective, but it seems that when you do a head-to-head -head comparison, they don't seem to get quite as much bang for the buck mm -hmm. yet, at least yet. Um, in terms of initial treatment, most interventions, the standard of care is pretty intensive early on. So you're talking about for the first four to six months, probably weekly contact for at least three or four months. The current recommendations are 14 contacts over the first six months. Mm -hmm. So initially a pretty intensive phase of treatment. And then the other standard of care is the extended care piece is really important. So once people have engaged in an initial program and they lose some weight initially, it's really important to provide them with some ongoing support and, and management. Um, and, and the way I think we have to think about this is obesity, like many other things, is a chronic condition. And we don't treat someone's high blood pressure for six months and say, okay, good for you, we're, mm -hmm. we're all set. We don't treat diabetes for six months and say, okay, we're done. I think we have to think about treating obesity as a long-term condition because that's exactly what it is. And so it's important to provide some continued contact and support for these people. And the current recommendations are for at least a year after initial treatment, we have something like monthly or more frequent if you can contact. And the goal there is to help keep the weight off because the weight regain is a challenge for most people. Mm -hmm. And then this sort of depicts what a typical intervention contact would look like. So the, the general flow of things would be that for most programs someone would begin by weighing in 
if it's a group, that's usually done privately. So they weigh in with the interventionist so that they can see how they're doing. Um, and then the group or individual contact would go something like this. Usually you initially review the self-monitoring forms to see how the week has gone for people. You check in with them to see what worked well, what didn't work well, what did they struggle with, did they reach the goals they were trying to set for themselves over the past week. Then you move into more of the content. There's usually a focus for that session about diet or exercise or some other focus, mm -hmm. um, which usually is interactive and a group discussion if it's a group-based intervention. And then finally, you end the session with some sort of goal setting for the week to come. So what are you going to work on over the next week? So again, it gets back to that point I made earlier. It's very action-oriented, it's very goal-directed, and it's very interactive with the participant. They're not a passive. Uh, recipient in Very this case. Good. So how effective are the behavioral interventions? So before we get into the effectiveness of it, I think it's important to sort of think about the continuum of research in this area. So if you look at the continuum, at the top of the chain, there's what we call basic research or epidemiological research. So here, the idea is in the lab, um, identifying what sort of variables are related to weight. In epidemiological research, looking to see in the population, what do we think matters in terms of eating behaviors and exercise as it relates to body weight. And from that, we can sort of say, these are the things we think need to be targeted in the behavioral weight loss programs that we develop. And so then to test those, we have efficacy studies. So mm -hmm. these are the, the well-controlled, um, tightly controlled trials that really test and try to isolate the effect of the intervention. So the samples are often you know, well screened to make sure that they're, you know, very homogeneous and um, they, if they have certain conditions, they may be ruled out. So the idea with efficacy studies is to really do it under, under the best case circumstances. Um, from there, moving down the chain, there's effectiveness studies. So that's saying, okay, we know what works under the best case scenario. Can we get those same effects or similar effects in more of a real world environment? So yes. with more real world populations, real world resources in a real world clinical or academic or community setting, how effective are these programs? And then finally, the fourth part of the chain is translational and dissemination research. So here's saying, okay, how can we take these and really scale them up so that we can on a more population level reach people, communities, organizations, um, so that weight loss can be achieved. Very and so good. what I wanted to say about that is the first two parts of this chain, the basic research and the epidemiological research and the efficacy trials, there's been a lot of work there. We, we know a lot from those types of studies as it relates to weight loss and obesity. We don't know as much about the last two parts of the chain. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work that still needs to be done as it relates to effectiveness and then particularly dissemination and implementation. Mm -hmm. But with that said, let's talk about some of the efficacy studies. So this, these are weight loss results from the Diabetes Prevention Program, or the DPP. So this was really a, a landmark weight loss trial. And this was a trial that was conducted with adults who had prediabetes. So these are individuals who had elevated glucose levels, but they weren't full-blown diabetes. But these are people who we know are at very high risk of going on to develop diabetes later on. So the goal of this intervention was to see if diabetes risk could be reduced either through weight loss, through diet and exercise, the lifestyle intervention, metformin, which is a drug often used for diabetes management and control, or a placebo condition. And so what they found here, and what you see here, is when you compare the three conditions, the lifestyle intervention, those participants lost a significant amount of weight over the course of the study, and it was different than the other two conditions. Mm -hmm. So this was an intensive diet and exercise behavioral weight management program. And over the long term, it was efficacious in reducing weight loss. Mm -hmm. Another efficacy study was the Look Ahead trial. And the Look Ahead trial was also a weight loss study. It was a little bit different than the DPP because in this case, all of the participants had type 2 diabetes but the goal was to help them reduce their risk for cardiovascular disease complications from having diabetes through weight loss. Okay. And here there were two arms. There was the intervention, which was the lifestyle weight loss program. 
and then there was a control arm, which was an educational control condition. And so what you see here is that those, the blue line, those in the intervention, lost a significant, really meaningful amount of weight during the intensive phase, the first year of treatment. And, and they did gain some weight over time and then started to lose again. And the control group lost a little bit of weight naturally over time. But even mm -hmm. with that regain and even with that natural loss in the control group, across 10 years of follow-up, the intervention still had a reduced body weight compared to the control condition. Mm -hmm. Good. So this was a really encouraging sign to show that we can achieve meaningful weight loss and it can be sustained over really what is a very extended period of time. And then the other study I wanted to bring your attention to represent a point about maintenance. So these are findings from the TOURS trial. This was another weight loss program, but the focus here was a little bit different. With the TOURS trial, they had people come in for a, a weight management program. During the first six months, they lost their weight, and then they were randomized to an extended care program. And the goal here was to try to prevent that weight regain that we talked about. And so the take-home message from this study, and there were three arms to, to the trial. There was a control arm, and then there were two extended care two extended care programs. One was delivered by phone and one was delivered in person. Mm -hmm. The goal being to prevent weight regain. And what they found is that both of the extended care programs, the phone and the in-person based program, had significantly less weight regain than the control condition. So this illustrates the point that weight loss maintenance can be achieved, but it's really important to provide that ongoing support to people mm -hmm. to make that happen. Are there other benefits to the interventions? Right, so, so weight loss is great, but we also want to know, does it improve other clinical outcomes, right? And the answer seems to be yes. So these, again, going back to the DPP, the Diabetes Prevention Program, in addition to weight loss, the primary outcome here was really diabetes prevention. And so here you see the prevalence rates, the development of diabetes over a three-year span among the three conditions. And so you've got placebo, and then the metformin, which is the medication condition, and then the lifestyle intervention. And so you see that among placebo participants, about a little less than 30% went on to develop type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. whereas for the lifestyle intervention, that was less than 15%. So what this amounted to was a 58% reduction in diabetes risk associated with a lifestyle intervention. So this was a significant reduction in risk over a three-year period. Um, so the answer here was yes, weight loss, a modest amount of weight loss, can really produce meaningful reductions in diabetes risk. And then these, again, similar to the previous slide, this uh, is the look-ahead trial. We looked at the weight loss data already in the first quadrant of this trial, that's the weight loss data presented again, okay. but this illustrates the point that there were other clinical benefits for these participants. So with their weight loss came improvements in glycemic control and physical fitness, and again, these are improvements that were maintained over an extended period of time. Very good. Yeah. So sort of the take home of what we know about the effects of behavioral weight loss programs is they are effective. On average, they seem to achieve about a 7 to 10 percent reduction in body weight. We know that's clinically meaningful in terms of reducing risk for diabetes and other cardiovascular disease complications or risk factors. Um, but we also know that weight loss maintenance is a challenge, weight regain is common, mm -hmm. and if we don't provide some sort of ongoing follow-up that many people are going to regain most, if not all, of the weight they lost. And that really speaks to the idea that we need to provide extended care for these people. And if we do that, we can significantly reduce the weight regain that is so common after initial treatment. And are there ways to predict long-term success? There, there are a few predictors that we have identified from the research in terms of what helps people keep the weight off in the long term. So here are some of the things that come from these findings. So one is we know that how much weight people lose really very early on in treatment is a very good prognostic indicator of how well they're going to do at long-term follow-up. And we'll, I want to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. In addition to that, there's a variety of beh individual behaviors that we know are associated with success. One of those goes back to self-monitoring. We know that people who lose weight and are successful at keeping that weight off uh, regularly keep track of their weight. Many of them weigh themselves daily, mm -hmm. if not weekly, but many daily. Um, they, with some regularity, continue to monitor their food intake. 
And you know, the example I think about there is like the speedometer in your car. It tells you how fast you're going. And if your speedometer is broken, you don't really know. Another example is, you know, when you put fuel in your car tank, you, you, you can read on the gas tank how much you've put in. You know that because you, it's monitoring it for you. Th the unfortunate thing is we often know less about the fuel we put in our body than we do about the fuel we put in our car. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where self-monitoring is so important to help people stay on top of that so that they don't see that creep in, you know, creep up in calories over time. Mm -hmm. um, we also know in terms of eating behaviors, people tend to continue to eat a reduced calorie diet. Mm. So probably around 1,800 calories a day seems to be the average. And there's some really interesting research coming out now to show that people who have lost weight and are trying to keep it off may have to consume fewer calories than someone else who weighs the same as them but haven't lost the weight. So there's something about the body metabolically sort of fighting back to try to push that weight back up. So people really have to continue to eat a reduced calorie diet to, to maintain the weight loss over time. And then exercise is also really important. So the current recommendations more for the, the public health recommendation is 30 minutes per day of activity. We hear that all the time. But for keeping weight off for people that have lost weight, it's probably double that. It's mm -hmm. probably more like an hour per day of physical activity in order to help them maintain their weight loss over time. And then also finally, regular eating patterns. So people that have a consistent pattern to their eating and not skip meals, that's also been associated with uh, successful weight loss maintenance. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and I mentioned on the previous slide, um, initial weight loss being a good indicator of long-term success. So these are findings from the Look Ahead trial, which we talked about earlier. And, and this is a study we conducted among those in the intervention arm. And what we did is we grouped them into three categories based on how much weight they had lost at month one. So very early in treatment, we said, all right, let's put people into categories if they lost less than 2% of their body weight, between 2 and 4% of their body weight, or those that lost more than 4% of their body weight at month one. And what you see in the graph is that those groups were substantially different and they were different over time. Mm -hmm. So even eight years later, those who had had a good response to treatment early on had maintained significantly greater weight loss than the other two groups. In fact, if you look, the green line, which are the people who lost the most weight early on, were at a lower body weight eight years later than those who, the blue line, even at their lowest weight at year one. Mm -hmm. So I think this has clinical implications because what it tells us is not everybody's going to respond and if they don't respond early on, their chances of doing well in the long term aren't very high. So I think that speaks to this idea that if we can start to identify those people, then we need to provide them with something different, a different treatment, additional resources, additional support, so that they're not sort of continuing to struggle in a program that's not working for them. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in looking at all of this information, are there differences in uh, racial ethnic uh, outcomes? Right, that's a good question too. So everything we've presented so far has been looking at just general treatment response. Um, but it's also important to look to see if there's subgroup differences. And so here, again, going back to the DPP trial, this is the Diabetes Prevention Program. This is a slide that breaks participants out into subgroups based on both race and gender. So here we have six categories. We have uh, white males and white females black males, black females, and Hispanic males and Hispanic females. And what you see is that most of the groups, with some variation, sort of track together over about a two and a half year span of time. But there's one group that seems to be an outlier, and that's the black females. So that's the group that lost less weight initially and are at a higher body weight at follow-up. So uh, findings from this study suggest that the African American women seem to lose less weight than the other groups. Similarly, another trial, the weight loss maintenance trial, um, was another multi-site, large-scale trial looking at a behavioral intervention for weight loss. And, and they found something similar. So here it's grouped into four categories. There's African-American men and African-American women, and then non-African-American men and non-African-American women. You see that the non-African-American men, so that's mostly white men in this sample, lost the most amount of weight. The African-American men and the non-African-American women sort of tracked together. They had very similar levels of weight loss. 
And then again, the African American women, they were the group that seemed to lose the least amount of weight over the, the initial 20 sessions of treatment. So the take home message here could be that, um, well certainly the findings would suggest that at least during initial treatment, African American women seem to not do as well in terms of weight loss as other groups. And so for a while people had this conclusion that these programs don't work for certain groups, African American women in particular. Um, but I think that the more recent studies have said, well let's take a step back from that and really sort of try to understand that better. And so some more recent work has looked at this over a longer span of time. So here you see, again, findings from the Look Ahead trial, which we presented earlier. And here we're broken up not by gender differences, but we do have four different racial ethnic groups. So mm -hmm. with the red line, these are the white participants. The blue line are the Hispanic participants. The yellow line is African Americans. And then the green line are American Indians. So what you see here is that at least at year one, so initially, all four of these groups were different from each other. So Caucasians lost the most amount of weight, American Indians lost the least amount of weight, and then the other two groups were somewhere in the middle. But all four groups were significantly different from each other in how much weight they lost early on. But when you look out to year four, those group differences disappear. Now certainly the, 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 the rating, the ranking of where they fall is still the same, but you've had this sort of convergence of, of weight so that what was different at year one is no longer different at year four. So if you follow the group out far enough, there tends to be this convergence of weight over time because what happens is the participants who lost the most amount of weight early on have more weight regain, whereas those who lost least have some regain but not as much, so they sort of end up in a similar place over mm -hmm. the long term. Mm -hmm. And then these are findings from the TOURS trial, which we presented earlier. Again, this is the study looking at extended care programs to try to promote weight loss maintenance. And these were all either uh, Caucasian or African American women. And what they found in this trial is that Caucasian women lost more weight initially, but they regained more weight over time. And the other really interesting thing here is that if you look at the Caucasian subgroups, this is the treatment, so these are the people receiving extended care versus the control condition. And what you see is that for the Caucasian women, it really mattered whether they got the extended care follow-up or not. So they regained much more mm -hmm. weight if they were in the control condition. But for the African American women, there was no difference there. So in terms of treatment, they fared really comparably well whether they received additional support or not. So I think then the take home message here is if you follow people out far enough, it seems that maybe the outcomes end up in a similar place, but how people get there varies. The, the trends over time seem to be different. And this last study would suggest that what participants on average need in terms of additional support may vary. Um, so there could be some racial differences there as well. It works, it's effective. What are the challenges? There are, there are many challenges. So we do know what works, but I think the challenge is taking what we know works and trying to translate that. I mean, if we're really gonna have a public health impact to, to address obesity on a broad scale, then there's lots of issues that we have to contend with. So everything I've presented here suggests that treatment has to be pretty intensive. We're talking about a lot of contact, over a pretty long period of time. And the reality is that's hard to do, both on the intervention side in terms of limited resources. It's also hard to do on the participant, the individual side, because they have to make time for this in a busy life. Um, so I think that balancing the effectiveness and the intensity required to achieve weight loss with what is also still remains feasible for individuals is really important and it's a challenge. So I think we have to figure out a way to repackage the interventions so that they meet people where they are. So this could be offering them in a, a different modality. I think that's mm -hmm. the excitement of telephone or web-based interventions if those are more convenient for people. I think there's some thinking about tinkering with the intensity. Could we still get meaningful weight loss but maybe with a little less of an intensive mm -hmm. amount of contact as what we've done in the past. Um, 
and then, you know, those aside, even if you have individuals who are ready, willing, and able to start a weight loss program, there's often limited options for them. So there's lots of push for primary care physicians and their practices to engage in weight loss efforts with participants, um, but there's lots of barriers there. Mm -hmm. There's lots of competing demands on the primary care provider's time. Um, there's reimbursement issues for that. So that often isn't happening. Um, there are commercial programs out there, that some of which are evidence-based, that can help people lose weight. Um, but the challenge there is that those often come with cost. Mm -hmm. And so th that can be a, a huge barrier for a lot of participants. Um, and then the other barrier is there may not be people in the community or programs in the community that are evidence-based, that, that have the expertise and the skill set to offer these types of programs. Um, and then finally, the sustainability issue is, you know, how do we help people lose weight and keep it off for the long term in a way that's feasible for them? I've talked a little bit about future research directions already, but a few additional things to think about is a lot of exciting work has been done. We know a lot more than we used to about weight management programs, but there's still a lot of questions that remain unanswered. Um, I think this question about dissemination and implementation is really important. Again, taking what we know can be effective and how do we scale that up and roll it out on a, on a larger scale is something we need to do more work in. Um, I think looking at more diverse populations, a lot of the work that has been done to date has been with a predominantly Caucasian, predominantly female population. So looking at interventions for men is really something that very little research has been done in. Um, looking at different racial groups and how they respond to treatment and what their treatment needs are is, is another area. And then age is important too. You know, so for instance, with older adults, there's some controversy about should older individuals who have obesity try to lose weight or is excess body weight a protective thing for them? So I think that's another area of sort of targeted populations. Um, also, we've talked mostly about weight loss, but I think it's important to think about weight gain prevention, and that's mm -hmm. particularly sort of targeting younger groups, toddlers, children, young adults. We know that weight gain is most pronounced in adolescence and young adulthood, so I think it's important to think about what can we do early in the life course, not just to treat obesity, but how can we prevent it in the first place with those younger populations. Um, thinking about alternative ways to deliver treatment, we talked about that in terms of web-based or telephone-based interventions, I think have a lot of promise. Um, and then also, not, not much is known here, but in some ways we still provide this sort of one-size-fits-all approach for programs. We try to tailor things a little bit to individuals' goals and, and needs, but maybe one day we'll get to a place where we can say, based on these demographic characteristics or these psychosocial characteristics or maybe even these biological characteristics, we think that this is the best weight loss program for you or this may be the best diet for you. So maybe one day we can tailor the specific intervention or recommendations or the specific diet to the individual needs of that of that person. Mm -hmm. Very good. This has been a very interesting talk about obesity and behavioral interventions to address and reduce obesity. And I thank you very much, Dr. Dutton, for being with us today. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching this health research talk. We encourage you to email us with any questions or comments. Also, please take a moment and complete the brief survey on the link on your screen. Let us know what you thought about it and how we can improve it for the future. Lastly, register on the NRMN website to sign up for the online mentoring and be a part of NRMN, the National Research Mentoring Network. Thank you.